Good morning. Um, my name is uh, Robert Wilson. I'm the IT director for the South Carolina Department of Commerce. So I live kind of just up the road a little bit in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, today I'm going to be talking about lateral movement. Um, just a little bit of background. I work for the state of South Carolina at the Department of Commerce. I've primarily worked in the public sector for um, state and local government and have been in the IT field for about 25 years. Um, in my current role, I'm basically responsible for all of IT and security for an economic development agency. So um, we do things like trying to get companies to come to the state. Uh, we also are involved with um, workforce things. So like uh, here at the, the B-Sides and the Cyber Center in Augusta, we do some of that kind of stuff for the state of South Carolina also. So um, my Twitter is frcolumba. You can reach me that way or via email. And uh, I am a GSE, which I highly recommend if you're on the SANS track to go ahead and try and be a GSE. Um, so why this presentation today? Um, lateral movement is a uh, hot thing. You hear people talk about lateral movement. Um, and the attack framework is also hot. So there's a lot of chatter about those two items. So I wanted to pick something that's part of the attack framework and apply it to uh, Windows networks. And um, it's something where anybody who, anytime there's a compromise, uh, there's going to be the, the tendency for an adversary to have to move. Um, so I want to address that. And then the other big thing is that I talk to a lot of IT people and I talk to security pure security people also. And you may or may not be surprised how many people actually don't use the Windows firewall at all. They either turn it off or they don't know what kind of functionality it has. And there's a lot of people here who um, may be in the beginning of their career or they might be a student and they don't know a lot about kind of the things that you can do in Windows that are free. This doesn't require um, any kind of fancy licensing it doesn't require uh, buying a third-party product. It's all built in. Um, so uh, related to that is giving me some ammunition about limiting lateral movement and talk a little bit about some best practices. So um, there are people in here who don't, don't know what, a, what TTPs are. So you go to some of these presentations and you hear somebody up here talking about stuff and they, they just drop this TTP bomb on you, and you might not know what they are. So whenever we're talking with people and we're talking amongst ourselves, we have to use common language. And the MITRE ATT&CK framework gives us a common language to talk about stuff, information security stuff. Um, so lateral movement is what's referred to as a tactic. So you have tactics, techniques, and procedures. So a tactic is a high-level thing and then you move down to a technique, which is a way of accomplishing a tactic, and then a procedure is the actual way that you, you perform it. So in, in the instance of lateral movement, some of the examples are um, passing the hash in Windows, pass the ticket, which is using Kerberos. So um, with Kerberos is an authentication method that's used in Windows. Um, RDP connections, uh, connecting to remote services, admin shares, uh, Windows remote management, stuff like that. So one of the things that I want for you to think about is think about the tactic level, which if you've seen the MITRE ATT&CK framework across the, across the top are all the tactics. So lateral movement, uh, privilege escalation, discovery, things like that. Uh, start thinking of those as a, as a principle that someone must accomplish, right? So the, in, in the case of lateral movement, the principle that they have to accomplish is moving from one machine to another. Um, then once you start look, thinking about it in that way, what you want to get toward is you don't necessarily care what technique they're using because you're concerned about what the tactic is 
and obviously there's going to be cases where you, you can't 100% do this, which is something that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. But lateral movement is one of the good ones that you can think about, think about the principle of lateral movement rather than the, the actual technique that someone is going to use. So the, the thought exercise or the war game or tabletop or whatever to think about is a flat network with servers and workstations that intermix with each other. There's no host based firewalls turned on and you have a bunch of credential reuse. So if you remember back to two years ago with the big um, MS-1710 attacks, the, you know, the, the NotPetya and WannaCry and all that kind of stuff, uh, there are a number of organizations who had multi-million dollar problems because of the fact that they were not limiting lateral movement. Um, so that's kind of the principle that you want to get toward is get away from flat networks as much as you can, um, which has to do with do you know what machines you have? Are they classified together? All, all your workstations in one group, your servers in another group, stuff like that. So just as a, as a quick review, as I was saying, there's people in here that don't use the Windows firewall. They're not familiar with it. Um, it came out around the Windows XP time period. Uh, they've changed the name a couple of times. Um, it has multiple configuration methods, um, kind of the, the modern way of doing it. Uh, Microsoft wants to push you toward using cloud services because they, you know, they want recurring income. So you can configure it with Intune, you can configure it with group policy, you can configure it manually. Um, it has IPsec functionality, which is one of the big things that people don't realize uh, that makes it a little bit different than some of the other firewall types. Um, related to that, it has Kerberos inter integration. So um, the Kerberos integration, what it allows me to do is I have a IP table set up on a Linux machine and I have two computers that need to talk to each other and I have IP address A and IP address B. IP address A can connect to port 22 on IP address B, right? That, that's kind of a traditional firewall type operation. In the Windows firewall, what you can actually do is use Kerberos inter integration to use authentication headers to create a connection between one Windows machine and another Windows machine and taking into account that machine's domain account and also the user account of the person that's on the computer. So I can make a connection to um, Martha's computer from Robert's machine, but only if I am Robert. So that, that is considerably different than the way that something like IP tables works. Um, it's also on by default. Uh, just like all of the Microsoft stuff, the default is probably not what you want, but it's a good beginning. So an example of that that I always like to bring up and nobody at Microsoft um, takes the hint is if I have an enterprise version of Windows 10, why does it have an Xbox app on it? So Microsoft has a lot of, you know, built-in, you know, I have an E5 license for, for Windows 10 Enterprise. Why does it have Candy Crush? Um, some, at, at some point, maybe they'll start taking some of that stuff out. All right, so default rules. This is a bunch of gobbledygook. You know, you see all this stuff. Um, this is, these are the default rules in a Windows 10 Enterprise um, firewall. So all these are on. By default, what's happening is any inbound connection that isn't listed is blocked. Any outbound connection um, is allowed. So inbound, out of the box, you're getting cast to, cast to device streaming server HTTP streaming in. I don't even know, you know, it's for mirror cast, basically. But you probably don't want those things to be on. And if you haven't looked at this, you probably should take a look. Um, so these are the outbound rules. You see a lot of stuff. Um, by default, it's going to let everything go out anyway. But if you were to change the default action to deny and only allow outbound things that are listed in the rule set, you're going to get Microsoft Pay going outbound, Microsoft People, 
solitaire, sticky notes, you know, all these things that you, a lot of these are um, Windows Store apps that are installed by default, MSN, weather, all these kinds of things. So as a, if you are a quote unquote old school person that you're thinking in terms of, I wanna let port 53 outbound for DNS, TCP and UDP or whatever, uh, Microsoft is not in that realm. They're thinking in terms of apps, which is cool, but you might want to move toward using traditional thinking for that kind of stuff and for your outbound connections, enforce and then explicitly list, you know, I want to do this via TCP or I want to let this computer talk to this computer. All right, so the connection security rule stuff is the thing that I was talking about before about our computers talking to, to each other. Um, so in this case, what I did was I set up a connection security rule using Kerberos between um, going, sorry, going from any computer to this machine 192.168.1.50 that I want to require inbound and outbound authentication for the connection and I want to use Kerberos and make sure that it's the user that I specify in the list and the computer. So if Robert Wilson makes a connection to 192.168.1.50 from a computer that is not listed, the connection doesn't occur, which is a lot different than allow these two IPs to talk to each other. So how many people actually knew or know that you can do that kind of stuff in Windows? A few, all right, that's good. I actually have been doing Windows stuff for a very long time and I had no idea until probably five years ago that you, you could do any of this kind of stuff. Um, so related to that connection security rule, here we have a firewall rule that uh, in this case it's RDP in. I want to authenticate that, that connection and then I actually want to encrypt it with IPsec. So you can, use, you can do uh, authentication header, you know, AH connections only and leave the traffic in clear text or you can actually encrypt the traffic also. So um, here's one of my notes from the field. Uh, this is actually someone on t Twitter responding to a conversation that I was having and this is a government person actually in Europe, not, not in South Carolina, um, who his response to some of this kind of stuff was his IT people, he, this is a security person, uh, his IT people will not let them even turn on the Windows firewall. So some of that is, a, uh, is antiquated thinking and some of it is, uh, it might not be, your organization might not allow you to do it for legitimate reasons, but I think we've kind of moved beyond that and the MS1710 stuff is when that really occurred because we've been moving away from uh, whatever, however you want to term it, an M&M &M where the outside of your network is crunchy and the inside it, you know, is all mushy. Uh, you can't really think that way anymore. Um, so here's a few resources for uh, Windows Firewall stuff. This Microsoft support article is basically gonna lay out everything that's required for Microsoft networking. Um, all the ports that are required for domain controllers, everything that's required for SQL. This is what a endpoint needs in order to do stuff. So one, one of the big things about that is related to um, tiering, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. Uh, is it necessary for a domain controller to reach out and talk to a workstation? Does the domain controller initiate the connection? No. So uh, for stuff like group policy, the, the workstation calls out over 445 to the domain controller to get the stuff. So you have to think through those types of scenarios. Um, one of the best possible classes for learning about this kind of stuff, in my personal opinion, is the 505 class, which Jason Fawson wrote. Um, heavy duty stuff, Windows, PowerShell, and a considerable amount of time is spent um, talking about the Windows firewall. Jessica Payne, um, who works for Microsoft, uh, 
in their security group. Um, she is awesome, so you should definitely follow her on Twitter. Um, she did a presentation in New Zealand, uh, whatever the equivalent of Ignite or whatever may be in New Zealand, where she talks about the Windows firewall. Um, there's actually a lot of good stuff that comes out of Palantir. Regardless of what you might think about Palantir, their Windows people are excellent. And there's a lot of um, stuff that they've written, um, like Medium posts and stuff like that. So getting back to the attack framework and thinking of stuff as principles, uh, the, the principle in lateral movement is adversary move, movement. So you have east-west movement, so in that case, Workstations talking to other workstations. And then you have north-south movement, which is an example would be going out of a workstation subnet into a server subnet. Um, so you could call that longitudinal. No, I don't know why. Everything has to be lateral, because in that case, it's longitudinal. So from an adversary's uh, perspective, they're always wanting to know who I am and where am I. This is the, the idea of graphs that attackers work in graphs and defenders work in lists, which is you know this big thing that people came up with a few years ago, uh, Microsoft, another Microsoft person. Um, and they need to pivot to get to other machines. Uh, from a, a defender perspective, you actually want to move toward thinking of your machines as cattle instead of pets, which is something that's kind of come out, that analogy came out having to do with cloud stuff, but it's also applicable to internal environments where in the case of cattle, you have a, this E-Corp thing, you know, if you're into Mr. Robot or whatever, um, where you don't care about E-Corp sales 19, it's gonna behave exactly like E-Corp sales 20. That's cattle. Uh, a pet is Elliot's local printer and the accounting group shared out to the rest of the people in their workstation subnet so you're already having to create a unique situation for that computer, um, which is not good if you, um, Ben this morning showed the, that crazy traffic jam picture and then the picture of you know, the NASCAR race. If you're moving toward the NASCAR race, you need to think of your machines as cattle, which sometimes is, you know, it's obviously it's easier said than done, but all of this is a journey you know, that you need to iterate through this stuff. So this is Microsoft's um, tiering, which has to do with these things called privileged access workstations. So you want your tiers to use similar kind of firewall rules in this case. So down there at tier two, those are all workstations. Workstations don't talk to other workstations. Um, they talk to servers and domain controllers. Um, servers generally don't initiate talk, uh, communications to workstations unless it's like Nessus or something, like a scanner. A workstation calls up a web server. Web servers don't call workstations. So the quick wins, uh, the number one thing is do not turn off the Windows firewall. Uh, the second part of it is iterate through rule sets. So begin with the default rules, which I showed at the beginning, using uh, group policy, Intune, or whatever to roll them out. And don't merge the local rules. So all that gobbledygook that we saw at the beginning with Microsoft Pay and the Miracast and all that kind of stuff, those are the default rules. You may begin with that, but what you want to move to is using group policy or Intune or whatever your methodology is you have a list that you apply to your cattle. So all of the workstations get this firewall configuration and you move away from having to create some kind of local exception for uh, this AP person's um, printer or whatever. Because you can get an HP laser you know, for $1,000 or whatever and uh, re replace it uh, so that you, you, you don't have to create exceptions. Exceptions are generally a problem. So don't let workstations talk to each other. That's the tier two thing, uh, because what's gonna happen is somebody gets fished and you get lateral movement. Um, North-south traffic, you want to make that, if possible, pass through something where you can get net flow. So um, 
Best case scenario, all of those connections would actually go through a firewall also. So not only do you have host-based firewalls, but you have network segment firewalls and not just perimeter firewalls. Um, Palo Altos can be relatively cheap, depending. So uh, two hypothetical situations. The exploitation of remote services, there was a zero, uh, O-day, zero day, however you want to pronounce it, um, in RDP a little while ago. The Blue Keep stuff, uh, which took a long time for there to be a working exploit, but let's say that there was one. You have a compromised endpoint. That person scans the, sur the current sub subnet. Um, RDP should not be listening on workstations in, the, in this scenario. Now, if you have developers, then you're gonna have a lot of pets. So it depends on where, where you know, what kind of environment you're trying to secure. Um, so the, the second one there is WinRM, which is awesome. WinRM in itself is cool. But if I'm gonna make an outbound WinRM connection to somewhere else, where is it coming from? Should you be allowed to make outbound WinRM connections from this theoretical accountant? Probably not. Um, that computer needs to be managed via WinRM, but they probably don't need to make outbound WinRM. So in that scenario, you could use the CareBro stuff to confirm in case somebody's trying to do something funny with you know, IP addresses or, or whatever. So this one is for the evil people. Um, if you were in some place where they were using the Windows firewall and they had everything blocked, like I can't talk to these other computers, and this theoretical accounts payable person gets compromised, but you want to get the CFO, theoretically you could use this taint shared content attack, which is the other cool thing about the attack framework is when you look at it, you're, you can come up with stuff that maybe you have never thought about. And in this case, this is the immediate one that I thought about. I was like, what? I've never thought about doing this at all. So I can't do normal lateral movement. I know that they both have access to a share that has Excel files on them. Um, I know that that's probably safe because it's internal. I don't have to mail anybody something. I put a, a reverse shell macro um, in the Excel document and wait, and then the lateral movement occurs because the CFO opens and trusts this Excel document, and hopefully everything else would fail, which may or may not be the case, and I get a shell back out over the internet. So that, that's something to consider. In that case, you'd probably have to have signed macros, which most people don't even come close to doing signed macros. All right, so the general review is make sure you're using the Windows firewall. Uh, move from your default rules to custom based on the environment. Uh, the other thing that I always like to push talking to people is this is the nirvana fallacy or you know, security absolutism, which other people have talked about today already. Um, if you have workstation subnets that you need to take care of, but you have that one case where somebody needs to do something special, you have one pet, don't turn that into the example from Twitter where the guy said, maybe someday somebody will let us turn on the Windows firewall. Um, and th this is how you, you get um, ammunition for talking to people in control, is just bring up Maersk, you know, the shipping people. Um, there's an excellent Wired article about Lateral movement is basically what it all comes down to about their network. Um, so the workstation thing to me is the biggest quick win that you can get. Don't let workstations talk to workstations. And you would be surprised probably how many people that's shocking to them. You talk to IT people and their immediate thing in their image is kill the Windows firewall or not even know that you can even do any of this kind of stuff or even care that, you know, the, the argument is we already have a firewall and they're, they're meaning the perimeter. Um, but you should move toward assume breach, which people have been doing for the last 10 years at least. So in those two cases, I'm just talking about outbound um, is pre, before somebody 
gets the box and they turn off the firewall. Um, if somebody gets the box, turns off the firewall, the computer that they're trying to talk to you isn't going to answer them anyway because they haven't gotten it yet. All right, so um, I'm happy to take a couple of questions now, um, and then I'll communicate on Twitter or email or whatever. But we have these, uh, a lockpick set and uh, an alpha wireless adapter. So if someone wants to um, ask a question, I will get my assistant to bring you the lockpick set if the question is good. Yes? Is that like, what's the Nirvana fallacy? The Nirvana fallacy is basically, um, it has to do with, if I cannot get to Nirvana, I'm not going to do anything. So it's, it's that, that fallacy of, if I can't do the Windows firewall for um, all of my machines, I'm not going to do it for any of them. So. Did, did you see who asked the question? Yeah. Yep. So, in, yes, sir. Um, I don't know of one specifically. I mean, me personally, I would start. I mean, that's basically an architecture issue, and. I would run through exercises of trying to imagine what this, if we're talking about Nirvana, what Nirvana looks like, and what are the milestones that we can take to get there. So I would start to examine what is the trade-off between doing it and not doing it. So if, like printing, for example, printing is one of these things that comes up a lot, um, using a network printer the workstation talks to the network server, and then the network server talks back down to the printer. And you, so in that scenario, you never have workstations having to talk to this computer that you're sharing a, a workstation printer off of. Um, so just determining what this list of all those kinds of, kinds of things are, and then iterating through, this is what we want to get to, which is no workstation communication. And then this is how we'd go about doing it. But I don't, I don't know of an author specifically that would talk about that. There, there might be some classes that would go more in depth into architecture stuff. But to me, that that's, um, depends on you know what what your company or organization does. What which book is that? Okay, Jones and Barlett textbook. Hey, Martha, take that down. Good. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I mean, personally, what I would do is, I, in, in that scenario, that small of a place, I would move them off of having an on-prem DC at all. Um, so in, in that scenario, it seems like you, you need to, to move toward using Azure AD, Azure AD, join machines, and um, authenticating that way, because it doesn't, it, it would be highly unlikely that they would be prepared to maintain that infrastructure anyway. Um, so the question would be whether or not that's something that they could take on, because it would probably require them redoing the way that they do everything. But a, a lot of those kinds of places seem to have IT guys, you know, that some of that's just an education thing. And the days of a, a law office running on-prem exchange and a domain controller for a 20-person place, they're, they're, that's just, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it requires evangelism on our part to move them away from doing that kind of stuff. Because ultimately, it makes it worse for us, too, because those are the kind of places that get owned. 
and then they're used to do all kind of other stuff. But um, if, if they, they've got a little Juniper switch or whatever, they can do VLANs on there if their IT guy you know, knows what they're doing, where you can do this kind of stuff, even in that scenario, um, but it requires a little bit more work. Um, so yeah, I mean, if I were a consultant in that scenario, I would definitely want to move them into what Microsoft would term to be a, a modern environment, Intune in and Azure AD. All right, let's give it up for Robert Wilson. Thank Great, you. Thank you.